So hi, everyone, and welcome to this Plus Acumen webinar with Kathleen Kelly Danis, the author of Social Startup Success. My name is Amy O'Hearn, and I am an Associate Director for Plus Acumen, and we will be getting started in just about one minute as soon as everyone has a chance to join us. Please feel free to add an introduction to the chat window, which you can find to the right. We would love to hear where in the world you're coming from and the organization that you're working. Um, and again, we will be joining uh, you all live in just about one minute here as everyone has a chance to do So hi everyone, welcome again from Plus Acumen. My name is Amy Ahern, I am the Associate Director here and I'm joined today by Kathleen Kelly Danis, who is the author of Social Startup Success. Um, we are very excited to have her joining us to talk about earned income strategies for nonprofit organizations. For those of you who don't know, Plus Acumen is the world school for social change and we offer over 30 free and low cost courses to change makers all across the world. And so we think that Kathleen's book is going to be particularly relevant to many of you who are working on some of these tough problems and issues across the globe and are looking for ways to do it that are financially sustainable um, to set you up to have the greatest social impact possible. So um, we are very excited to have Kathleen joining us and here is how we will structure today's session. First, go ahead and introduce yourself in the comment section. Please share your name, where you're joining us from, and your organi organizational affiliation, if you'd like. Throughout the webinar, you can also feel free to drop in any questions that you have there, and we will be selecting the top ones to answer, and we will get to as many as we can. If your internet connection does drop out for any reason, or if you want to view this later, we will be sending out a recording, so don't worry about that. Um, we will have a conversation with Kathleen for the first 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to you for questions. We'll keep everyone's microphones muted, so please go ahead and use the chat box, but we will get to as many of those questions as possible. So with that, let's dig in. Um, thank you again for joining us. If you just tuned in, I'm here with Kathleen Kelly Danis, the author of Social Startup Success and a lecturer at Stanford University. At Plus Acumen, we have seen increasing numbers of nonprofit leaders taking our courses on social enterprise development, business models, and we've heard from many of you that you're seeking new ways to test revenue streams and adapt to a changing funding plan. You want to find ways to sustain your critical social missions, but need to find entrepreneurial approaches to fund your work. So this was one of the reasons that we were so excited to see Kathleen's new book come out this year. Kathleen is herself a social entrepreneur, having co-founded the nonprofit organization Spark, which focuses on building a community of young global citizens promoting gender equity. She is also a lecturer at Stanford University, where she teaches courses on social entrepreneurship. She undertook her research on this book to help codify the lessons about what it takes for a social startup to scale successfully. The book is packed with great new research and insights so we're excited to bring you just a preview today, but we would encourage you to check out that full book for lots more insights. So Kathleen, with all of that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your new book, and what prompted you to write it? Thank you so much for having me, Amy, and Acumen uh, for all the incredible work that you do, and uh, so great to be here before a, a global audience uh, this morning um, from San Francisco. Well, so my journey to write social startup success really started from a very young age. I grew up in a small town in Napa, California, and my parents were very involved in nonprofit work, and so we often tagged along with them to volunteer for the local soup kitchen or the hospital. And um, and so our dinner table conversations growing up often revolved around not just the people in our community who didn't have enough to eat, but whether the organizations themselves had the resources that they needed to survive and thrive. And 
So I became um, involved in nonprofit when I came to San Francisco as a young lawyer. I was billing my hours by day as a corporate lawyer and um, at, at night starting this small organization uh, called Spark, which engages young people um, and particularly millennials in gender equality issues. <clears throat> Spark was amazing. We had an, a ton of buzz and we had lines around the block for our events and we were really off to a great start. We were doubling our revenue every few months until like two thirds of nonprofits in the United States, we hit a wall. We couldn't get the capital that we needed to help the organization get to the next level. And so I became really curious. Why is it that we were having such a hard time? We knew that our work was impactful and we wanted to have more impact, but we couldn't get the capital like so many organizations face. And I realized that, that the spending wall was actually a real thing. I started researching this question at Stanford and uh, found that two thirds of nonprofits in the United States are $500,000 and below in revenue. Now, you know, for many organizations around the world, of course, <laughs> $100,000, $10,000 could be enough to run a really great small community-based organization. Um, so it's not so much about the number, but realizing that actually a lot of organizations in this country and around the world are struggling to survive on this treadmill, constantly trying to just get enough money to cover their programs, and as opposed to really focusing on the impact that they want to have. And so I set out on this journey to figure out why is it that some organizations are able to scale past that hump and others aren't. And I traveled the country, uh, serving hundreds of, of early stage social entrepreneurs uh, and interviewing 100 organizations, their staff, their beneficiaries, their funders, all to get to the bottom of this question. Why is it that some organizations succeed and scale and others don't? And so when I was doing this research, I kept waiting for someone to say that it was just you know, charisma or a brilliant idea that got people ahead, but nobody said that. And it's not to say that charisma and a brilliant idea aren't important, they of course are, um, but ultimately it comes down to these very teachable strategies that I highlight in Social Startup Success, which any organization, no matter how big or small, can implement. So that's what's most exciting to me as I think about what I want to accomplish with this book is to help give people the tools that they need to be successful in their organization. That's so great. And as we turn to the topic specifically of today's webinar, which is earned income strategies, how do you define that? And what have you seen nonprofits start to successfully do? Yeah. They develop? Yeah. So in the, in the book, I talk about the five strategies that organizations use to uh, get ahead and, and particularly to get past that hump in the early stages, which I define as $2 million and above to reach, reach a point of sustainability. Um, and so I talk about the, the five, which are testing ideas, measuring, uh, in, measuring impact, funding experimentation, selective leadership, and storytelling. So the, the third one, the funding experimentation piece, is really critical because what we see in these organizations is that they tend to has a combination of earned income, so generating money outside of philanthropic contributions, alongside philanthropic donations to come up with a funding model that works for them. There's some really interesting research from William Foster at the Bridge Stand Group, which talks about, many of you may have read, the, the top 10 funding models. So it's kind of a, 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 a seminal piece in the social uh, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, uh, which talks about different ways that organizations can achieve sustainability using philanthropy. And in that um, article, he talks about organizations that have gone past $50 million in, in revenue. So we're talking about huge organizations. And in fact, there are only 170 organizations that have achieved that scale. Um, that has been found in some time. So that's just a very small sliver. The majority, the vast majority of organizations, and, and I'm sure many of the, the 
folks on this call are much, much, much smaller and, and really focus on um, these, these early stage testing. And so what William Foster and his team found was that until when you when you get organ an organization started, that it's really about getting just the seed money that you need to get it off the ground. So you really will only have you know, one or two or a few donors to help get you uh, off the ground. Then as you go um, more and more towards uh, achieving growth, until you get to $3 million, you're going to have a ton of different sources because you're going to be testing different alternative revenue strategies to get to what they call the natural match, which is the, the one kind of funding source that is going to be most of which will sustain you in the growth period of $5 million and beyond. So for that stage, you know, there's all sorts of income that nonprofits can tap into. It's philanthropic income, which can be donors um, on the individual side. It can be uh, funders from foundations. It's government money. It's, uh, it's looking at earned income. I think about it as anything that is outside of the philanthropic bucket and thinking generally, how can you get paid as an organization for the work that you're doing, either by um, your customers or your beneficiaries, or by third parties who are invested in the success of your program. That's great. And I know in the book you point out that some sectors have been more effective at pursuing earned income strategies than others. What are those and why do you think that is? Yeah, this is a real, I think, tension in the sector right now. I think the pendulum has swung from, you know, whereas charity used to be about really just philanthropic dollars. We've seen a lot of focus on earned income as um, an important strategy for generating income for your organization. In fact, you know, when I talk to a lot of organizations that have gone through the 2008 recession, that earned income was critical to helping give them the fuel to get through that period when so many individual donors were dropping out and, and funders that had promised multi-year grants which were reneging, and the earned income was critical. But I also found uh, in my research that the pendulum in many ways has often swung too far in, in the other direction. That you have these donors who are maybe influenced by success in the business world and expect that organizations will um, come up with earned sources of income to fully sustain their organization. First of all, that's not what I'm here to say. I think that earned income is an important piece of the puzzle, but for the majority of organizations that are looking for an earned income, this is only going to be a part of what they're doing because most nonprofits are solving market problems where people have fallen through the cracks, whether it's homelessness or education in low income areas or um, looking at trying to solve problems in the criminal justice system. You know, so they're not going to be able to find market solutions to solve those market problems. That's just a fact. Um, and the reality is that there, as you say, are some sectors that are going to be much more primed for achieving earned income revenue, such as um, education, where we have state mandated dollars that are going toward the education system, and so nonprofits can tap into that um, money. Health is another area where there um, is uh, state mandated money or um, insurance uh, money that people can tap into. So there are certain areas that are going to be much more primed for success. Um, areas like human rights and, um, you know, maybe uh, criminal justice issues or environmental issues, much more difficult to find earned income sources because you're solving issues where the beneficiaries are not going to be able to pay. And it actually might be a conflict of interest to try and seek money. So, for example, Accountability Council is an organization that I'm involved with. I'm 
uh, board chair for the organization, and we help advocate for grassroots communities around the world that have achieved, uh, that have suffered human rights and environmental rights abuses as a result of international finance development projects like mines and pipelines that are places like the World Bank. So these are communities that, first of all, can't pay, um, a, a community that has um, been displaced from its, its town can't, can't pay to have representation from accountability council. So we're not seeking money from them. They're often against companies um, that are coming in and doing this work. And so for us to go out and um, try and get money from companies, would, we would be able, we would lose trust um, with the community that we're serving. And so we have to um, accept only, and, and same with government money, by the way. So we accept philanthropic dollars because that's how we can remain independent. Um, and while there may be some long-term earned income thinking about whether we can get places like the World Bank to pay for sustainability, right now we're just trying to get the World Bank on board with making sure that they're adhering to human rights standards. We can't ask them to pay for that in addition. So I think that every organization has to do some soul searching about the extent to which earned income is appropriate and feasible in their case. And, um, and, and, and also be honest with funders when they say, what's your sustainability plan? You know, philanthropic funding might be a sustainable fundraising plan. Um, but where you can, I think in earned income is a really great choice. Great. We will dig into some success stories and case studies from Kathleen's book, where she shows you really good tactical examples of how or other organizations have gone about doing this. But first, before we do that, I know you've talked to so many nonprofit innovators as a, in, over the course of your research. What do you think are the common pitfalls or mistakes that people start to encounter as they begin to experiment with earned income? I think the biggest challenge that nonprofits face is that they tend to take money where they can find it um, in ways that uh, can be really detrimental to the mission of the organization. So I think any organization that really wants to focus on earning income needs to first assess what is our mission and how can we really serve our mission with our fundraising business as well. And this is a really interesting question in the nonprofit sector because in the for-profit sector, you have a business that is uh, serving customers and the customers pay for that business. Um, and so if you don't have customers that are paying, then the business, the company goes out of business. <clears throat> in the nonprofit sector, we don't have the same kind of sort of market forces at work. We have on the one hand, um, the, the nonprofit, which is doing work to support customers or beneficiaries on the one hand, and then we have donors on the other hand that are paying for those. So I think it's really important um, for us to acknowledge that sometimes the donors are not going to have a better sense of what, you know, what the services are that they're receiving and how can nonprofits be the intermediary to really understand what the best solution is going to be as opposed to chasing dollars where they exist. And this is a lot easier said than done because when you're at, you know, like we talked about this funding wall, you know, when you're right up against that funding wall, it's hard to say no to um, money. <laughs> um, and yet, ultimately, it's going to be detrimental to the cause. So I think what all organizations have to do is figure out how can you make your fundraising business mission aligned with your ultimate mission. And so one way we did that with Spark when we had our first um, fundraising strategy when I was young and in my early 20s and I had no idea what I was doing, our big strategy idea was to make a list of the wealthiest people that we knew <laughs> and to go out and call them and try and um, get them to give us money. And that was a terrible strategy. Nobody picked up our calls, first of all. Um, but second of all, we realized that actually that was not a strategy that was serving our mission to engage the next generation of donors. Like going out to older women in their 50s and 70s um, could be 
eventually successful in getting us some, some bigger uh, checks in the door. But actually, if we spent the same amount of time chasing down a $10,000 donor as we did getting 10 of our peers to stretch themselves to try and get 10 of their peers to get money, that we were A, teaching them how to fundraise, B, developing those skills so that we were ultimately cultivating our mission, which was to educate the next generation of film profits. So every organization needs to think about their fundraising as a, a mission-driven approach and thinking about how you can create a strategy that is both um, brings money in the door as well as serves their mission if you can. <laughs> That's great. So it definitely can be a challenging journey as nonprofits start to pursue these entrepreneurial approaches and test to earn income funding models. But now that we've heard some of the ways that it can go wrong, um, I would love to hear any stories of a real nonprofit leader who you talked to who got this right and how did they start to go about actually implementing an earning? Mm -hmm. Well, one organization that I love that did a fantastic job of developing an earned income strategy, Hot Bread Kitchen. Hot Bread Kitchen was founded by Jessamyn um, Rodriguez out of Harlem, New York. And when she first started the organization, she was really excited about the possibility of generating 100% of the income to support a low-income um, training program for, for low-income women to get them into the food industry from the bread sales that they would make. So they would be able to um, bake the bread in the training program, use that money to then um, sell the bread and then fun funnel, the, funnel the money from the sales back into the training program. And that would eventually allow the organization to be 100% successful. <clears throat> Jessamyn realized that actually, um, first of all, she was, I was on stage with her recently, she said, if she had it all over again, there's no way she would have gone into the bread business. She would have done something like pest control or laundry where the margins were not so razor thin because we, as we all know, bread only lasts a couple of days. So you can't, you know, even if you have the capacity to stockpile and make a bunch of bread, that's ultimately, that's not going to help you out because it, it, you, it's perishable and so you have to sell it quickly. Um, so there were a ton of profits to be made. Um, and even the profits that they were making, um, she was able to sell the bread in a cafe. I highly recommend the cafe if you're ever able to go in Harlem. The hot bread kitchen, avocado toast is amazing. <laughs> um, so they, they do sell, they sell goods at the cafe. They sell goods to major uh, retail outlets like Whole Foods and JetBlue. Um, and then they have an incubator for small businesses and primarily women who want to go out and sell their goods at farmers markets or on the streets of New York. And so those three sources of income, um, which they tested to get right, were all really critical um, to helping to support the organization. But she realized that and actually, she was selling the program short by not accepting philanthropic donors. But she had philanthropic donors that were really interested in supporting the work. And by accepting that philanthropic capital, she was able to take the program a level further that she might not have been able to if she was looking to be 100% sustainable. So, for example, she was able to provide child care for the women while they were in the program, even though that wasn't necessarily the profitable thing to do. She was able to keep the women in the program longer in a way that was better for those women in terms of their ultimate outcome in getting jobs, um, but maybe wasn't the profitable thing to do. So um, all of this testing resulted in not uh, an organization that was 100% reliant on um, capital from earned income, but that actually was much more balanced between 65% earned income and 35% philanthropic capital. And that's what's been able to sustain the organization. Great. And I see that we have had some questions come in, which is great. So you can please feel free to continue adding those in the chat box to the right. Some of you are wondering, again, if we could repeat the name of the book, which is Social Startup Success. And I'm joined here with Kathleen Kelly Janis, who is the author and a professor at Stanford University teaching social entrepreneurship there. And she is sharing some case studies and examples from the hundreds of nonprofit innovators and entrepreneurs that she talked to over the course of her research. Um, and now that we've heard a little bit more about Hot Bread Kitchen, I would love to have you dig deeper into the 
six strategies that you've outlined in your book for how nonprofits can start to think about where to even look for potential mm -hmm. sources of earned income. I know that's really important. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go through each one of the six strategies um, one by one. And what's critical to remember is that there is no silver bullet. I think, you know, everybody wants to know, like, okay, what do I need to do to earn income for my organization? And again, like I said in the beginning, it's really all about the testing. There is no one that fits all funding model for organizations. You need to figure out what is the funding model that is going to be best suited to your mission, um, as well as where you're going to be able to access the capital. And for every person, that's different because it depends on your organization, where you're situated geographically, where your personal connections are. And so you need to take all of that into account if you're thinking about where you're best suited to earn income or generate some profit capital. So the first strategy that I talk about is to sell your service equity. And um, here what's critical is to uh, try and think about how you can tap into people who are interested in buying your services whether it's your customers um, or it might be even a third party. Uh, so, for example, Code 2040 is an example of an organization that was founded in San Francisco by Laura Wiseman Powers, who right around the same time founded the organization that there was um, all of this just what happening around um, Google reverse revealing its diversity numbers and, and finding that they were abysmal, very low percentage of African Americans and, and Latino engineers and the companies. And so <clears throat> Code 2040 seized upon that opportunity and developed a fellowship program to help train uh, black and Latino workers for their um, for the tech companies like Google and LinkedIn and others. And they realized that actually this was a valuable service that they were providing and that Google and Apple and LinkedIn and all of these tech companies needed these trained black and Latino workers and they needed the association with Code 2040 to show that they were on the right track to remedying those diversity numbers. And so Code 2040 has been able to develop a revenue model that taps into that and charges big tech companies um, who have plenty of money to <laughs> give. Um, to uh, pay for these fellowship programs, to pay for diversity training, all of which Code 2040 um, can, can do and has paid for a big chunk of their $8 million annual budget. Uh, the second strategy I talk about is this idea of combining uh, free and paid work. So the reality is that if you're charging your beneficiary for fee for service, you may not be able to uh, charge them fully, depending on their capacity to pay. Uh, and so you can develop a sliding scale that allows certain clients to pay and others not, depending on needs. So for example, Open Media Project is an organization that works with governments to get their government transcripts and proceedings online. Certain cities are more capable of paying than others. And so they do free for some, and then for others that can afford it, they charge on a sliding scale of $300 to $3,000, depending on um, their capacity. Another really popular way uh, that has been born out of a lot of these crowdfunding for, um, platforms like Kiva, for example, is to offer services on a loan basis. So Kiva is a, is a microfinancing platform where donors can give loans to um, microenterprises in the developing world and then those people can pay them back when they are able to. <clears throat> and this is really um, valuable, not only for the beneficiaries, the microenterprises, to give them the time that they need to pay back the, uh, the money, but um, ultimately it's uh, effective for the mission as well by giving them that time, Kiva is able to achieve a 97.1% repayment um, of their loan, which is phenomenal. Um, another organization that does as well is One Acre Fund, which provides small farmers in uh, Africa with training uh, to help make their farms more productive. And so the farmers get the training up front. They get some of the seeds and the equipment that they need to uh, support their farm. But then eventually they are able to um, wait to repay that 
uh, over time when their crops are showing that they're able to um, pay it back the money uh, later on. So this is great because, um, again, it, it allows um, one acre fund to have to produce less over time um, and they can reuse that many that can go back into feeding their program. And one organization that I, I think has been really creative in, in creating retail innovation is Living Goods that was founded by Chuck Slaughter who had this aha moment when he realized that a big barrier to distributing health products to low income people in Africa was the distribution channels. And so he thought of the best distribution model that he could imagine in the for-profit context, which is Avon, which actually also started to solve that same problem in rural America, that they were having trouble getting um, distribution to rural communities. And so uh, Living Good is serving both the need of developing uh, low cost health uh, products for rural communities in Africa, but also at the same time, um, helping to provide jobs and training to community health workers who go out and distribute those products. So the money that they earn is able to then go back into the product development and, um, and that helps sustain organizations. Great organizations doing uh, creative retail innovations that you can check out are Benetech um, and DREV. This is a really fruitful area for testing for health products in particular. Um, another strategy that I love is this idea of teaching beneficiaries to fish. So if you have an organization that is looking to give business skills to employees, then a really fruitful area for testing is actually creating businesses where they can work to help give them the skills that they need, but then they can go out on their own. And then the business itself um, can help sustain the organization. Now, if you talk to New Joe Venture, when I, when I interviewed Tess Reynolds, figuring out what those businesses are is a really tricky balance. Like they have used um, a bicycle shop, a restaurant, um, they have a really successful uh, screening, teacher screening business for printing. They've done other businesses that have failed. So for example, um, they had a technology business which brought IT support to local businesses and the kids weren't properly equipped or trained. And so that business went under. So you have to give yourself the space to also fail because um, that is part of the learning process as we all know. And finally, a really fruitful way to test earned income is to collaborate with government. A story that I love is the story of Last Mile Health, which really started working with governments from the very beginning to enroll them in their success. Um, and the key here is to figure out how you can even develop policy to help support the work so that it becomes a line item in the government's budget. So, for example, Last Mile Health was working with uh, rural people in Liberia, and the government knew that it had a problem with uh, lack of access that there just were not enough doctors to serve those rural areas. And so when Last Mile Health came up with a community health care program where they had these community health workers that were serving those populations and providing treatment and diagnoses from using cell phone technology and, and other ways um, in those rural areas, the government was very happy to pay for those services because it was serving populations that they couldn't otherwise get. And so there's great examples um, you know, all over the world of organizations that have collaborated with governments to try and get governments to pay for their services. And ultimately, that's what social entrepreneurship is all about. It's providing the testing ground in a small and nimble way that the government never could so that we can scale solutions more broadly around. And so um, I think showing how you can be a, a testing ground for government is a really great way to also get funded. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for all of those really concrete examples of other inspiring organizations and social enterprises mm -hmm. that have found really flexible and creative ways to pursue earned income strategies, even in some of the world's most challenging contexts. Mm -hmm. Really great to hear all of those stories. Uh, before we open it up for questions, I know you also cite in your book a very helpful roadmap 
for other organizations that decide they want to start experimenting with an earned income model. And that is a process that comes from the late, great Gregory Dees. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love if you could just go over those five steps for what you would suggest other organizations like, undertake if they want to start experimenting in this area. Yeah, I outline this more in the book and social startup success. But like we said, the, you know, the biggest challenge that organizations face is figuring out how to avoid mission threat. How do you avoid uh, moving away from your mission um, in pursuit of capital, um, which might not ultimately be um, the best pursuit of impact. And so the best way to start testing earned income is to reaffirm your mission and to really um, ask your staff, ask your um, employees, what, what is our mission? To see if they have a clear answer. Um, and once you do that, then you can go into brainstorming different options for trying to generate earned income and really apply the testing models that we hear in human-centered design. We often talk about a user-based approach and prototyping on a small basis. You know, all of those things can be applied to fundraising too. And, and I think we are often very um, ready to apply human-centered design to product development, but there's no reason you can't do that uh, in the fundraising sector as well. Um, and once you brainstorm your options, you can um, assess the impact that it would have on your mission, connecting those first two steps, um, evaluate feasibility. You're going to go out and develop some of these programs. You have to make sure that you have the staff and the resources to help support that earned income strategy. And finally, developing an action plan for moving forward. Great. So that's a very useful roadmap, um, and I hope that other organizations find it useful. And I want to make sure we have time to open it up for questions, but before then, can you just share how people can find a copy of your book if they want to learn more and where they can find you online to get further resources? Yeah, absolutely. So Social Startup Success is available at your favorite retailer online. Uh, for those of you who are calling in globally, it's also available on uh, Audible as well as Kindle. Um, and you can find out more, including getting access to uh, free resources that I have on my website at happyjanice.com and join me on Twitter as well at Kelly Great. So now I want to make some time to open it up for your questions. So Kathleen shared a lot of different resources and frameworks and case studies, but please feel free to use the chat window to type in any questions that you might have and we will kick off the global discussion from there. So the first one we have is, I'd love to know how the mission of a nonprofit relates to the possibility of finding sustainable income. I have the feeling that old statements like help every child in the world are less suitable than more concrete missions. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, um, it's just the best practice in the nonprofit sector to have more concrete missions. And so the more that you can really be clear about your ultimate theory of change. Um, so thinking about not just what your ultimate goal is, like uh, what was what was that the, the um, example, like every child in the world, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but really being thoughtful about where your impact is along. So most organizations are really good at talking about their program activities, really good about talking about their ultimate end goal and telling a good story about the vision for the world, not so good at connecting those dots. So in Social Startup Success, they talk about how you can develop a theory of change and how um, you can get better at tracking not just the outputs of your work, like um, how many people are participating in your programs, but also the outcomes. What is the ultimate end goal um, and, and what, how are you um, showing progress towards that, that goal? So how does that relate to earned income? Of course, it's connected to um, how you can generate more income. If you're very clear about which children, for example, in the world that you're serving, you're going to be able to do a better job of figuring out who are the third-party beneficiaries that are interested in this work, and um, what are the governments that are going to help, and what kind of government support that they're going to provide. So for example, Code 2040, wasn't just trying to get every company in the world diverse. They were really capitalizing on these 
core diversity numbers that Google presented and focusing on the tech sector as a way to, uh, to leverage their expertise in getting particularly engineers involved. Um, and so thinking very specifically about the population that you are trying to reach will ultimately help serve you test the various options for earned income. I would totally agree. One exercise we often recommend that nonprofits start with is actually something that's adopted from the consulting firm Bain, which has like a focus on the core map. Mm. So really to try to figure out what's your core area of expertise and then how could you leverage that as a nonprofit to potentially find great So I totally agree that starting with a clear concrete mission is yeah. gonna be really useful. Um, someone was also asking about the case study you cited earlier. Um, and the name of that organization, if you didn't catch it, was Hot Bread Kitchen. Mm -hmm. And do you know more where people could find out additional information about that organization and founding story? Yes. Well, um, you can find Hot Bread Kitchen in Harlem, New York, and go get your avocado toast there. <laughs> that would I recommend. Um, there's also a great article that I would recommend that we can include in the supplemental materials called In Search of the Hybrid Ideal, which features the Hot Bread Kitchen article and um or sorry the hot bread kitchen story and um and help get a little bit more context about some of the considerations that they were facing as they thought about whether to be a nonprofit, whether to be a for profit, how they could be a nonprofit that was accepting earned income um, and gets into some of those more legal considerations as well as the challenges of going after nonprofit capital when you are a sustainable business. I mean this is something that we haven't talked about is that it's messy when you go out and you're trying to be a hybrid organization with earned income as well as philanthropic capital. The um, the investors will say, well, well, if you're a nonprofit, why aren't you getting capital from a philanthropist? And then the philanthropist will say, well, if you are um, earning income, why do you need our support? And so this is a real challenge. Um, and the organizations need to go out and be prepared not just to tell their story, um, but like in the case of Hot Bread Kitchen, justify why part of their revenue is earned and why that's a positive thing, but why also part of their income will always be philanthropic and the market gap that they're filling in um, in in achieving that. There's also some really great stuff that that um, Hopper Kitchen is doing related to Me Too because the the um, service business and the, the food business is so um, male dominated. So this has actually been a real opportunity for them to step up on behalf of food workers and say that this isn't going to really be solved in the kitchen until we can get not just you know entry level jobs, but you need mobility where you know the people in charge in the kitchen are also women. Right. Right. So hot bread kitchen's a great story. I never mm -hmm. finding out more on it. Uh, let's see. We had another question more on mm -hmm. legal structures, which I know come up a lot when we are starting to talk about nonprofit hybrid model for profit. Um, and so we typically say that you should defer to kind of legal guidance within your local geography because we're not going to be equipped to provide counsel on yeah. all of the intricacies there. But in general, are there legal limits for charities in terms of earning income to support their charitable work? Yeah. Any kind of yeah. input on that question? So my background is as a lawyer. I, I don't just play one on TV. <laughs> um, and I still find this area of law very, very complicated. There's a wonderful resource that I that I point to in social starting success. I have um, a, a table of options, which I would call it the buffet of options. Everything from on the one hand fully nonprofit to on the other hand fully for profit, and all of the different variations in between for profit arm with a nonprofit subsidiary or vice versa. Um, what I always tell people, um, and and actually just to put a fine point on that. Look at the um, look at the options, but I also see that ultimately everyone needs to get legal counsel to ensure that what they're doing is the best um, fit for their organization in terms of the kind of capital that they can generate, but then also in terms of abiding by the legal context and by the by the legal um, structures in your particular context. That said, the reality is that every organization, um, for the most part, could could do a variety of 
different structures and still be, you know, following the mission of the organization. But ultimately, what it's going to come down to is where are you going to best access capital? So one of the case studies that I talk about in the book is an organization called Embrace, which probably many of your um, viewers have heard of. This is um, founded by Jane Chen. It's a baby warming scheme for the developing world. And when she started it, she started it as a nonprofit. She thought that this was going to be a mission-driven organization that was going to sustain itself on philanthropic capital um, and, um, and maybe generate some earned income as well to support the work. But actually, she realized that, um, first of all, a lot of the R&D was really expensive and she was going to need a lot more capital. But ultimately, there were, there were a ton of investors who really wanted to give her cash. And so um, she wasn't going to refuse that and realized that actually she had a lot better shot at, <clears throat> at accessing capital on the for-profit investor side as opposed to being a nonprofit looking for philanthropic dollars. I mean, another benefit of, of being a for-profit is that some of the dollars are just much higher. I mean, when you're a nonprofit, you're thrilled with a $100,000 grant. When you're a for-profit, you know, the dollar signs can add an extra zero or two. So I think that's something that every organization needs to consider from the get-go. Um, and get the right legal advice up front because in the case of Embrace, for example, they had to totally shift their um, 501c3 into an LLC, and that was a very expensive um, and complicated transition for the organization. And I would just reiterate um, Kathleen's recommendation that you check out the menu of options that she cites in her book. If you're just trying to get oriented to this landscape and understand yes. the structures and options that exist, I've been reading about this topic for many years, and that's probably the most comprehensive and high-level, useful overview of yes. getting oriented to what those structures are. So that's a great yes. resource. It's quite useful. As a menu, not as we Yes. Cite <laughs> like the lawyer. <laughs> um, another great question. We talked a little bit about kind of the trends you saw across sectors as they started to pursue earned income strategies. Um, but did you see any trends in the types of sectors of target groups that were more successful? For example, the food industry, education and training, or certain target segments such as youth employment or women small business entrepreneurs? As you think across the whole sample of people that you spoke with, where yeah. do you think you saw the most trends in success? Yeah, so I, I did, I printed out some of my um, survey data that um, really shows where some of the comes into play. So uh, in certain subsectors, such as education and healthcare, as I said earlier, we saw a trend in the survey data that the organizations that identified themselves as healthcare or education um, nonprofits were much more likely to have higher earned income as a percentage of their um, full annual budget. So for example, um, in the case of education nonprofits, it was close to 50% of their annual budget. Again, that makes sense because those are organizations that are um, able to tap into already allocated government funding for education for schools. And um, when you look at other sectors, um, it's still high, but much less. For example, 27% um, of health organizations' uh, budgets were allocated to earned income, 24% of global development, and 22% of So those are a couple of the segments um, and, and the ways that, I mean, this was no by no means a comprehensive survey, but I think it certainly is indicative of um, when you are able to access earned income as an organization. The other point I'll make is that you also have to look within those segmented populations about who you're serving. And, and, you know, are you serving, you know, the very bottom of the pyramid, or are you serving maybe one or two layers up and able to charge those individuals for services that you would not be able to charge the poorest of the poor? So, for example, Care Message is an organization that is using a tech platform to um, provide uh, services to hospitals um, to get their patients to come back after surgery. They found that the translation was often 
a challenge and getting people to come back to the hospital after their surgeries was a real challenge and it was resulting in bad health outcomes. So just not great for any hospital. So to improve health outcomes, uh, they've developed, Paramessage developed this, this tech platform that allows hospitals to have better contact with their patients. Care message has been very successful. They're, they're um, a multi-million dollar organization that is working with um, you know, tons of hospitals around the country. But care message has really struggled with staying mission aligned because they do want to serve the lowest income um, populations. And so you know, they constantly have to struggle with, hey, which hospitals are going to actually pay us good money and, 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 and help us sustain this, you know, now $6 million, by $6 million organization versus are we able to reach out to hospitals that maybe not won't be able to pay us as much, but are doing a better job of it. So I just think it's, it's not so cut and dry in terms of which uh, type of issues that you're addressing. Uh, it's a combination of issues as well as which segment of that population you're actually Serving, how deep you're going, is, are you touching them briefly, are you touching them more deeply, which is going to be more expensive as a program, and so a lot of different considerations, and again, as an organization, your job is to justify your mission, stay mission aligned, and when you go out and seek funding, be able to speak to why that is. I'm glad you touched upon the fact that complexities of cross-subsidization models, particularly, because I know we've seen that some of the great classic social enterprises like Arab and I care in India mm -hmm. are using this kind of model of uh, pay what you want so that higher income customers can subsidize then the treatment for lower income or bottom of the pyramid consumers, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. But as we look across Acumen's portfolio of social enterprise investees that have pursued this model, you're definitely right that some are able to navigate it without having mission drift um, in, in more successful ways than others. So Absolutely. it's certainly complex. And I think it gets back to this point that I made earlier that you cannot use market solutions to solve market problems. I mean, if it were profitable to bring clean water to the 8 million people around the world who, who need it, um, Coca-Cola would have done that long ago. Uh, and so I think we need to realize where there are market failures and where nonprofits um, are really a very important boy. Mm -hmm. Great. We have two final questions I want to make sure we get to because they're great ones. The first is coming from Keith, who is with Somasource, another great organization we admire. Um, and he is saying, once hybrid or donor and earned income models become the norm in the nonprofit space, what do you anticipate are going to be the future challenges that nonprofits might wrestle with as this model matures? Mm. Hi, Keith. Hi, Samasource. <laughs> Um, I speak for Sam Sarkis and Social Startup Success. Um, I would check out the, the article that I mentioned, the In Search of the Hybrid Ideal, which does a really good job of outlining some of the challenges. I think some of them we've already talked about is figuring out who you're serving and, and that question of mission drift, like are we actually going to achieve um, service to the, the most neediest populations if we're using a purely hybrid approach? Um, this question of funding funders needs to mature and get used to this question of, well, are you for profit? Are you nonprofit? Should you accept philanthropic dollars or should you accept um, investment dollars as like this kind of binary thing and helping um, funders also to realize uh, the value of this hybrid model and kind of how that fits into their funding model. I mean, I think funders in general have this kind of box that they want to put everybody into. Um, and so we need to get funders to think a little bit more outside the box. So, um, and then also legal structures. I mean, these legal structures are complicated and even, you know, the, the legal structures and menu of options, I think is a great start that I feature in social service success, but, um, you know, that's already changed. Like there's already you know, new legal structures that are developing. And so I think the question is, I mean, Hot Bar Kitchen's a great example. They would have liked to have like, Explore the for profit model with a non profit subsidiary or something like that, but it was too expensive to, to pay the legal fees and to figure out a way to do that. So they went as a non profit model, you know, partly because it worked best for them, but then also partly for practical reasons. So we need to we need to make sure that the laws are supporting the kind of social change organization that we want to see. That's great. And then I think this is a perfect question to end on because it addresses kind of the mindset of the sector.
sector, which you codify so well in your book around the entrepreneurial approaches that these organizations that are successfully scaling are really embodying. Um, so this last question is, how much of a challenge is the mindset of the sector for you, changing or refreshing donor-oriented thinking into a more market-oriented one, shifting from beneficiaries to a view of customers? Are we doing it fast enough, and what is your experience or opinion on this shift that has to happen? Uh, well, I think it's happening naturally, and I think that we are living in very exciting times, but innovation is being applied to social change like we've never seen before. And I see it in my students at Stanford that they no longer think in terms of like, either I'm gonna go work for a nonprofit and, and be poor, or I'm gonna go work for a for-profit and be wealthy and donate that money. <laughs> um, they're thinking about how am I going to achieve social change no matter where I am, no matter what institution. 85% of millennials ask a company what their social cause is before going to work for them. That is exciting, and it's forcing companies to have more social impact programs and to have volunteer opportunities for their staff just so that they can keep them um, and retain them as employees. And so as I think about the next 50 years of social entrepreneurship, I think there will come a point where we'll just drop the social part, and it'll just be part of what companies do, what nonprofits do, and everybody will be playing an important role, but we'll all be having some sort of a social mission um, in mind um, as we go about our work, which is so inspiring and amazing and great note to end on, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all for tuning in today. I know we had participants from places as far reaching as New Zealand to Kenya to Oakland. So thank you all for joining and thanks to Kathleen for sharing such great case studies and concrete insights. We hope that this has been useful to you. Um, stay tuned and check your inboxes because we will be sending a follow-up with both a recording of this webinar if you want to share it with colleagues or go back and refer others, along with some supplemental resources, both pointing you to Kathleen's website and book, Social Startup Success, and some courses and additional opportunities from Plus Acumen. So thanks again, Kathleen, and on behalf of Plus Acumen, thank you all for joining us.